these samples here so were actually good. made, I did a week in France. So these were actually prepared to demonstrate different types of finishing, um, purely for this class. So I've got all sorts of bits and pieces here. Uh, one of the, use them on, let's get them in order. One of the favorites is to put on two so opposite sides of binding and leave the edges raw. And then on the other side, you fold the edges in. And then when you put those on, you've actually got totally enclosed. You'd over sew those at the edge. So you get a sort of log cabin effect with those. But as you can see, it does sometimes, especially with small bits, it pokes. So that's probably the simplest. Most people use a continuous piece of binding. Uh, if it's a big quilt, obviously you will join strips. It doesn't have to be on the bias, it can be straight grain fabric, but if you join the strips, then you would open them out and cut them on the bias, but I can't call these out. You would cut them on the bias and join two together so that when you have a seam, it is a diagonal seam that doesn't have the strain that a, a vertical seam would have because you're going to go all the way around the quilt, you don't want that seam coming apart. Uh, basically what you do is you find somewhere to start and turn that edge in and you go around and by the time you get to the corner you only stitch to the seam line and then I go up diagonally to the outer line so that will set my fold line then you fold the binding away from you and then back down towards you and pin the binding on and you start stitching a quarter of an inch in from the outside edge and carry on and what you get is a fold that when you've trimmed it all and turned it over it will fold into a bias a, a, a diagonal binding and bias on the corner but that is only a fold if you want to secure it you will have to hand stitch it and of course any of these bindings you're going to fold them over and hem stitch all the way around so that is a continuous binding. The traditional way is to go edges to the middle or knife edge. And when you do that, you have a line of quilting that says this is the edge of the quilt, but you leave extra on the outside. And with a small thing, it might be quarter of an inch. So you would leave two lots of quarter of an inch plus the seam allowances. Uh, on a bigger quilt, that gap would be three-eighths of an inch or even half an inch apart. You very carefully take the front and the back fabrics away and trim the wadding to exactly what you want and then you cut the fabric either the quarter or three-eighths of an inch bigger than you've cut the wadding. Then what you do is you turn it to the back and you fold the top over the wadding and you fold the back inside by the same amount so that you've got the two edges together and you pin that and you do a running stitch so that you do the running stitch like that around and then you can go back in and do another set of running stitches or not around the edge because that will give it extra strength if you want to do that. Personally on a small quilt I'll do one set of running stitches because you're actually going through four lots of fabric and the wadding and you know you're doing it by hand. The old quilts there was great kudos to all the hand quilted quilts if you had a sewing machine you did those last two rows on your sewing machine. A it was easier on your hands and B it showed everybody else that you had a sewing machine. <laughs> <laughs> a variation on that which is not Welsh so none of the quilts in the gallery are like it because they're all Welsh is to do a piped edge this edge will rub away quite quickly, but the piped edge is stronger. So you would make piping cord and that you would attach first. And then you would do exactly the same. You trim the wadding, you would fold the raw edges of your piped edge in and you'd fold the backing over. And this time you would just hem that backing to the back of the piped edge and you get a nice sharp, a more durable edge to it but that was definitely a Durham thing. Some of the Welsh quilts have frills around them 
that wasn't to any special finish to them. It was because in the 30s the beds got bigger and rather than design bigger quilts, they made the same size quilts but frills on the edge to make the quilt big enough to fit the bed. The way I normally do it is with a straight grain binding again, but each side has its own piece of binding. And you start stitching a quarter of an inch in from the outside edge, and you stop a quarter of an inch in from the other edge. And each piece, each side, has its own piece of binding and I do that first and then cut the edges to match. It does mean when you start doing, if you've done the two top and bottom, it does mean that you have to sort of fold them up and out of the way when you do the others. But you want the stitching to be as close as, to the corner as possible on both. Once you've got them in place, <coughs> you trim off all the rest of it. With silk, I'll do it a bit at a time because silk frays with cotton, I can go all the way around and do it. It depends on the fabric. So now I've got this trimmed, and the reason I've left the trimming is because now when that goes over, it's a full binding rather than one that's got a bit skinny in places. And I've got a binding mitre tool that I'm now going to turn the corner with. If only I can get it. You fold the seam lines down towards the quilt and you put the binding edge straight and you do the next corner exactly the same. And had I got some pins, I would now pin this in place, but I haven't, so I won't. And I've now got, these are parallel and that is now a diagonal fold on my quilt. And it doesn't matter if it's a square quilt it's obviously across the quilt. If it's a, an oblong quilt, like all these cock quilts, all I'm interested in is this first bit of the fold. It doesn't matter that it won't be across the whole quilt. Where my stitching has finished, I will make a little mark. I'll get it this right this time. I can then put the 90 degree part of the binding mitre tool along my stitching. I'll put the corner where I finished stitching and make a mark perpendicular to where I have finished stitching. Mm -hmm. This now is the 90 degrees and I lie one edge along the fold of the quilt and I move it up until one edge touches the end of the stitching and the other edge touches my vertical mark. I will then draw around that and then that is now my stitching line. So I'll take that to the sewing machine and I will stitch around it and then I will trim it and I will finish up with something that looks like that. Okay. And then when I turn it, and I haven't got something to poke it out, I've actually got a mitre corner that stitched. is stitched front and back. Okay. Whereas if you fold it, you have to do that bit of yeah. stitching yourself. Yeah. And then you just literally fold the edges over and hem them down. But obviously I would poke all that out and trim yeah. it properly. But it's just a little demo piece. You can do that with a binding mitre tool. You can also do it with your quilt ruler. Okay. Because it's got a vertical edge and yeah. if you turn that 45 degrees, you've got, got the, the same 45 edge. degrees thing like that. Mm -hmm. But obviously, a um, little piece like that is much easier to show you with the proper yeah. thing. Yeah. But you That's can do great. it with you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's a very, very lovely collection. Thank you.